Welcome back, everyone. That was via microphone. <laughs> and the table without the microphone didn't hear that. <laughs> Second half of our evening. I'm not going to be standing in front of you much longer. And for those of you that are confused, I am actually standing. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up straight. <laughs> <laughs> I will stretch it a bit. <laughs> if you knew Jan, like I know Jan, you would invite somebody else to introduce him. <laughs> there is no one person in the room that knows Jan better than our previous speaker, Artie Moore. Artie, it's your privilege to introduce Jan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I mean, you, you never saw a dude blush before you even start talking about him, and he's already wearing the kilt. <laughs> so to give you a bit of an idea of Jan Roberts, Jan was born in the Netherlands, so he can officially call himself a Dutchman. Grew up in Scotland um, for, from the time he was 18 years old. That was the most time that he spent there. So he's known as the kilt-wearing Dutchman. Um, his accents vary between the Dutch and the Scots accent. If you catch him, he will do the, the, the brave heart speech brilliantly with the accents as well. Um, but about Jan, 30 years in the oil industry, was actually an expert. Um, and he left there when he joined the John Maxwell team. He was looking for significance. He was looking for something more, more powerful, more ways to impact lives, more ways to change lives. And when he joined the John Maxwell team, an opportunity arrived where he was able to volunteer with 150 of the John Maxwell mentors to go to Paraguay and Guatemala. So Guatemala is where he first went with them. In one week, they trained 17,000 people. They impacted 350,000 people, and by the end of the year, 1 million people. And that was the values-based leadership program that he interacted with. He was so blown away that when he went home, he actually quit his job. It has not worked since then for the last three or four years. What he's done, though, with that passion is he's taken that and brought all of his knowledge, all of his wisdom, and everything that he is as a human being and brought it to South Africa. And he's looking for ways of how he could actually connect with everybody here and then change and impact <coughs> lives here. And through that, he created, uh, with myself, we've got the Key Leadership Institute, and it's all about impacting millions of lives. And that is the whole point of touching lives in a powerful way. So he doesn't like us to talk about the fact that he is now the executive director with the John Maxwell team in Orlando. He goes there every two, every two, <laughs> twice a year, every six months. And he's one of the most renowned, revered people. In fact, John Maxwell actually wrote about him in his blog, and that was um, published this week. So this is Jan Roberts. And what he's going to be doing is teaching you some of the secrets that he now has access to as an executive director to the speaker club and all of the amazing uh, techniques that he's allowed to share from the John Maxwell side. So that is Jan Roberts. <coughs> Welcome. And I've got to live up to that. <laughs> That's why I hate when she does that. I wish I, I would have been able to introduce you, but you did a great job, Gavin. 
thank you very much. Now, if I'd had my kilt on, I could have done the freedom speech, but uh, as I haven't got it on, <laughs> Ah, why not? Why not? <laughs> yes. why, not indeed? why not start? Like, I hadn't planned this, but Artie brought it up. I am William Wallace, and I see a whole army of my fellow countrymen here in defiance of tyranny. You have come to fight as free men, and free men you are. What will you do without freedom? Will you fight? Against that lot? No, there's too many. We will run, and we will live. Aye, run and you may live, fight and you may die. But many years from now, in your deathbed, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day until that for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell your enemies that they may take your freedom, that they may take your life, but they will never take your freedom! <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. Now, uh, anybody has seen the Braveheart film? <laughs> well, at least you met my family. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I mean, uh, not planned and hadn't done it for a while, but once you know it, it's, it helps a bit. But uh, speaking, that's better. I don't want to stand in the limelight. <laughs> speaking. Who thinks they're actually a natural speaker? There's some here, now, of course, we go naturally, we don't go back all the way to our birth. <laughs> because, uh, as Les Brown and John Maxwell both say, we weren't born as natural leaders or natural speakers, because we were all born naked, uh, didn't know anything, and all we could do was scream. <laughs> and um, the crazy thing about speaking is, communication, that we, we all do it. But once we have to stand in front of somebody, the fear that comes over us sometimes is frightening. <laughs> but, you know, what happens a lot is we start our speaker training, we start speaking in front of people, we even join Toastmasters, and some of us have been there for a while and we've got a, a Toastmasters champion amongst our mid as well. And then all of a sudden we stand on the stages and we stop developing ourselves. Now, it's the same as in, in any other thing, uh, martial arts, wherever you go, uh, once you stop, there's only one way you can go. And so, may I ask you a question, who continually develops himself? As a, whether it's a speaker, a trainer, a facilitator, a coach, who invests in themselves continually? Now that's a great thing to see. Because, of course, we're in the Professional Speakers Association, so I, th I would expect quite a few hands to go up. But there's quite a few people who actually, either they haven't got the money or they, 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 they're too busy now, and they make excuses for not investing in themselves and it doesn't pay. Now, can you afford not to, rather than can I afford to? And that doesn't only apply to speaking. I used to be in the oil industry when I was 30, more, more than 30 years, I started when I was two. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> but we weren't only expected to keep investing in ourselves, and the company uh, gave us training as well, but we had to. Because if you don't keep investing in yourself, not only actually y use it or lose it, but you, c you keep falling behind. Because new things come up, and now, of course, for us slightly older people, Technology, and we have to catch up with technology because technology is changing so so fast that it's it's hard to keep up anyway. And you know, frightened of, of, of all this new stuff, I was just in the future lab in Siemens. And when you see the stuff that is coming, I'm glad I'm a speaker, not a lawyer, or not a, a, a in a car manufacturing or any of these other businesses that slowly start to disappear. And and a lot of the business will, but there is new businesses that come about. I mean, I remember that my dad had a, a record shop, you know, for, for the younger people, that's one of these round hard <laughs> things, like, you know, you put on the record player and you play. They come back now, but a bit like an old MP4 kind of thing, you know. <laughs> but my, da my dad had a record shop and, and my great-grandfather um, started one in Amsterdam, in, in Holland. But there's very few people, if it hadn't been for that, the, the fact that they're coming back just now, there's very few people now who would know what the record was. They, they, they barely heard, heard of a CD. It's all online now and, 
And again, that's another industry that's changed. But what I want to take you through tonight is, is maybe going back to basics a little bit and realizing what is happening on our way. So um, somebody talked earlier on about doing exercises and pairing up and things like that. Well, I'm glad you actually introduced it already because it's coming. We're not going to be sitting here just listening to me all the time. Uh, I'm uh, actually glad that uh, we're going to stand up, especially after having this wonderful dinner and, and dessert as well. I think it's maybe good to stand up every now and then. So what we're going to do, we're going to pair up. And that means two of you. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's people standing in the middle of the room and saying, have you got a party yet? No. Uh, where is the other one? Oh, oh, but have a look around. Pair up with somebody close to you, preferably, because we're going to do a few exercises through this, this presentation, and uh, it's going to be wonderful that, you know, you just stick with the same partner. That makes it easiest for me, at least, and for yourself as well. You don't have to find a new one every time. So, if you, what we're going to do, stand up and balance. So, if... You pair up with another person and just stand facing each other. Now, you are you facing me? Has everybody got a partner yet? Yes. Okay, now what I want you to do is face each other with your feet roughly about shoulder height, shoulder width apart. Shoulder height apart. Shoulder height apart. Sorry. Okay, never mind Gavin, he's sitting down again. And then um, I would like you to hold each other's hands. And now I would like you to lift one leg. Which one? Your right, right one. So if you both, if you both uh, get your right one up, it stops the collision. And, and then I would like you to let go of your hands. Yes. Now lift your, lift your leg just a little bit higher. Okay. Now stay there just now. We're not going to sit down yet. Now, can I ask you a question at this point? What happened? Who, who, who made that balance happen? Was it you or was it your body? Us. What happened? See, because, because while, while you're balancing, I'm sure all, all everybody's feet is going a little bit like this. Yes. You know? And some people stand, stand here quite proud, like like, like <laughs> and, and, and other people are giving it, you know. But everybody can balance a bit, but everybody's feet doing a little bit like this. Now, are we consciously doing this? Or is, or is our body just doing this? The body. Now, just in case you're not sure yet how that happens, I want you to do the same exercise again, but this time count back from 47 to zero in threes. No, 47, 44. <laughs> so, so you don't have to, if, so this time, no, no, but, so this time again, you, you, li you, yeah, you lift the same leg, otherwise it might be easiest. Lift the same leg and start counting back. 47, 44, 41. 35, 35, 35, 35, 35, 35, 35, 35, Take a seat before you fall over. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you might have got the 30 something and I thought, okay, where we go next? So, without embarrassment. But, <laughs> your body kind of does this so, because now you know you, you kept your conscious mind busy, so it, it came from somewhere that you, you've learned. So, your body do, does it more like a reflex. Now, how did we learn this? Did we learn this through time? Or did we learn this through practice? How did we learn this? I know it's multi-choice, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 time and practice. Yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, practice over time, I suppose, so if you really want to be smart. But 
I mean, this, this, you weren't born like this. Yeah. This is what I'm getting on. You weren't <laughs> born with, with the, I mean, babies didn't all of a sudden go and, I can do this. No, bit by bit, you got there. <coughs> so, practice. Now, is it always practice that makes you get better at something? What else? Must have purpose. Pardon? Must have purpose. Yes, purpose. So purpose Observation. Observation, yes. Anything else? Thought. Making mistakes. Make, yeah, making mistakes. So what you're also talking about really is evaluate your, ex your, your experiences. Mm. So evaluate the practice. Now, it's not always the case, of course, but there are so many different ways. But you can actually do a lot just through practice. And if you think about it, there was a guy called George Dorman. He founded the Institute of Mental uh, Mental Awareness, I think. It is in Philadelphia, and what he actually did was with with he started with little children, and the little children he said, you know, to learn to crawl as a little child. A child you need to basically put them on the floor. Because if you leave them in a cot, that's never going to happen. So put them on the floor, face down, and leave them as long as possible on the floor. Because what happens is, you know, eventually the, the, the limbs start moving a bit, and then all of a sudden they, they, they feel movement. Now once they feel movement, they go from one, they go from crawling to creeping. Eventually they go to, to try to stand up. And as the process goes, they, they eventually start walking and some run like you say bolt. But he said, there's one thing that had to happen there. Is, he said, we, we should leave the children on the floor as much as possible because if we want to, to give them the best chance of getting there as quick as possible, we need to give them that opportunity. And we need to give them that experience. So we need to couple opportunity and, and experience together. And by doing that, they found out that children would start to walk a lot quicker than those that didn't. So it's it's just it's, it's a simple simple way where even even if children from from that point on we learn things if we get opportunity and through experience. I would like you to have another little exercise here. Uh, I'll may, maybe be on here. Oh yes. Okay. Now I would like you to stand up and. Get a direct line of sight to me. So just stand up. And you know the old uh, cord guns or the, or the cup guns? You know these things? So pretend you've got one. And I know my head is big enough you couldn't miss it if you were blind. <laughs> but my nose is a little bit smaller. So pretend you're going to shoot my nose and you because use your thumb as your visor. Yeah? So I, I will not move, so I'm, I won't make it a moving target. But pretend you're actually shooting this. Now, all of you have more than likely got one eye closed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, yeah. what you know, do you keep keep pointing, oh. keep pointing. Now open your eyes. Now what happens to your thumb? It becomes transparent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah. Very good. But it but it stays right there. Yeah. Yeah. Now close the other eye. Okay. Oh. Oh. Shot to here. Now now open it yeah. again. I shot first one. Close it again. <laughs> yeah. Open it again. You sit down. <laughs> now what happened? <laughs> You're still walking. <laughs> now what happened? When you had the one eye closed, you, you could see that nose perfectly. You got a, even when you open an eye, that thumb was still there. But when you open, you close the other eye. Well, I, I didn't move, of course. But <laughs> It, it is an opti optical illusion that I did move, okay. but of course, if you close the wrong eye, you would have missed me by a mile, thank you very much. But we are actually, how many eyes are we born with? Two. Two. So, two eyes, two cameras. So, from there, we get two pictures, if we've got two cameras, mm. right? Mm. Now, how come we don't see two pictures? Because what has happened over time is 
that two pictures became one. And one eye became the master, this is the one where you actually saw me straight on, <laughs> and the other became a bucket. But the, the combination of it, it gave you some neuro neurological idea that now you've got actually depth. It stops you walking into walls and things like that, so you see things in front of you. But did we have to learn this kind of stuff? It just happened over time with, with, with little babies again, and I go back to this, this institute, the little babies, they, uh, they, they turn them facing up the way, and when they saw light, they got very excited because at the beginning, babies have very poor eyesight. eyesight. You can try to put in a little uh, handkerchief over your face, and that's kind of all they see. Now, once they start changing this to black and white, when they start seeing the differences, they get excited because now they start seeing a, a little bit of color as well. But if you actually keep them, keep them lying down uh, for them to start crawling, they, they, they start getting this vision as well. And gradually we start, through a natural process, we start getting the picture together. Now, when we, uh, we learn a lot of stuff without being constantly involved. And uh, uh, these are just two of these things. And I want to, uh, I know where I'm going with this and you don't know yet, but I mean, a lot of the stuff we learn just by not even being aware of it, but we learn them. And let's face it, have we got parents in the room here? Have you taught any of these, the, the, the crawling on the floor to the kids so they start walking, or that the eyes, you have to tell them, you've got two, two eyes now, but you make sure that you get this stuff together. <laughs> no. So it's a natural process. And a lot of stuff in the speaker business is very natural. But we also... And, we, and we'll see another exercise very shortly, that there is some stuff we learn that is natural, but it's going to hinder us. And some stuff will help us, as you'll find out in a, in a little while. So bear with me when I go into this. But so if this stuff is going to help you, it'll, it'll speed up your opportunity. But if it's going to hinder you, it's going to slow you down. So surely you want to know the things that will help you and hinder you, because you don't know, only want to know the stuff that will help you, but you also sometimes need to know the stuff that will hinder you. Some of it is already in your subconscious, so you need to actually start knowing this kind of stuff. So, with opportunity and time and repetition, that's how we learn. Again, there's different ways we can learn, but uh, uh, if you have the opportunity and you take the time, as I said, they're, they're both, and you actually keep repeating it. I mean, uh, just a simple thing that, that is not always evaluated experience that will do it. Sometimes it's just repetition and I know there's very few people who wear a watch nowadays but you know you can do this exercise yourself you can actually put your watch on the other hand and if I asked you in 10 minutes time what the time was if it is on that hand now you would still look there but give it only a very short period of time because you feel the weight on the, especially if it's a bigger watch you feel the weight give it a very short period of time you would start looking on the other hand yeah so it'll create that experience that that repetition and the habit without doing too much about it. So, and we didn't have to evaluate this. Oh, okay, I, I, put, I put it on the other hand. Now I need to, no, no, you know. Once you look there and it's not there, you know that's on the other hand, unless somebody stole it, of course. But, <laughs> but I mean, it's, 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 it's a repetition. So, if a lot of it is repetition, doesn't that make it much easier to access, much easier for us to get certain skills and tools available to us that we can learn and become more skillful and, and more able not only to stand on a stage and be a speaker, but the more able to deal with the public. And, and this is actually one of the things. When we start getting an idea that we, only, we don't only stick to our, to our own uh, area of, 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 of strength, and it doesn't put you in a box, it just, this is just another uh, tool that you can, you can look at. But if you know that, other people, that a lot of people don't actually learn <coughs> from you, because if you're like this, you only speak to the visual people, there's a lot of people who just, you lose them. But now you, now you know this, and, and you can look it up online as Artie said, now you know this kind of stuff, it's just another tool that you, you can learn about, you can actually not only communicate better at home with your family, with your children, with your peers, but actually, actually on, a, on a stage, whether you're a, f a facilitator, whether you're a coach, I mean, we always ask open-ended questions as coaches, but if now we can actually ask open-ended questions and speak into them the way they learn, it makes us even more effective. Just a simple tool. <coughs> so, when do we actually stop learning? 
we should never stop learning. I mean, it's very, fairly obvious. But I mean, when most of you put your hands up, that we're actually still investing ourselves and and doing th things to actually increase our knowledge. To inc if we can become better, we can help our people better. And we're, the one thing we're in is we're in the people business. Whether you're a facilitator, a coach, a trainer, we're in the people business. And if we can be become the best we can be, and that takes personal development. And it, it takes personal development in the field you actually work on. So, but sometimes we learn things that automatically that, that aren't helpful to us. And, you know, sometimes if you actually hurt yourself, I, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a true story about a friend of mine who had a, a, had a hip that was really playing up. Uh, we used to work in an oil industry and, and he, he started limping a lot. Now he refused to go to a doctor for a while. Then eventually he actually uh, went to a doctor because it got so bad. The hip got replaced, brand new. But what happened in the meantime, because he started protecting it, the other side started bothering him a little bit. It didn't really hurt him, but because he put so much strain on it. Now, the, the doctor said there was nothing wrong with that hip. He's had test after test after test. And eventually the doctor said to him, he says, you know something, what's the, what the big problem with you is not that the other hip is wrong now, this one's better, but you still learn something to protect this and you haven't taken that protection mechanism away yet. So if that happens physically, surely this happens mentally with us as well. Sometimes we do things, we keep doing things because they become a habit and we, we don't know, that, first of all, we need to know that we've got them, mm -hmm. but sometimes we don't know that we've got them so we don't know how to change. We don't know what we don't know. It's as simple as that. So, there's a, a, a thing. In a world of change, the learners will inherit the earth, while the, while the learner will find themselves perfectly suited for a world that no longer exists. Now, it might be a, a strange example, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Anybody, now I'm not going to say remember, but anybody knows what a T-Rex is? Mm. Everybody does, of course. Seven, eight ton beast with a jaw that, is, uh, that, that they said had a bigger power than the, the, the great white shark. And we also know what a mouse is. Now, 65 million years ago, would you have bet on the T-Rex or the mouse to survive? You know? I mean, if you would have gone to the bookies, I mean, you say the T-Rex will survive. You didn't know how to, never learned. And, and, and the environment started changing. We, we know all the ages that uh, the world has gone through. And now we're in global warming again, I suppose. Oh no, but we can't say that anymore. <laughs> it's the change. But <laughs> T-Rexes died because they do, uh, couldn't adapt to change. How much are we adapting to change? And the question is how much do we need to adapt to change, even <coughs> as speakers? We need to start using, and I, I love that, I, I'm sorry I can't be there, but I love that this, this um, half-time uh, seminar is coming up a day and a half where they start talking about technology because we need to start utilizing the technology of today so we can position ourselves to be better tomorrow and to be more visible, to be, be see, seen. But, you know, we're global now. <coughs> I said to some friends of mine, uh, we're only, we're only uh, an email, a Skype call, or a flight away from each other now. So global col collaborations are happening. It's, it's nothing strange anymore. We're actually working with f five people ar around the world just now to, to work on an online program. We have Skype calls, we have Zoom, we have all these kind of things. So we, yes, we need to start embracing that technology even as speakers, as trainers, as coaches. <coughs> so then we have another one. And that was saying that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Now, somebody told me that a long time ago about school, and, and there's nothing wrong with education. but they said you really start learning when you unlearn what you've learned in school. But then if you if you look at that, learning is, is is fairly easy because we see that still as external. You know, you go to a YouTube, you take a book, you go to a, a, a master class, you, you do all these kind of things, but it's fairly much external. And that is, that is quite easy. But unlearning, a lot of that is internal. So now we need to know what, what do we need to unlearn? Because it's, sort of, it's, it's easy to say, oh, we need to unlearn some stuff. Yeah, but what? See, even as speakers, have we learned some stuff in the past that doesn't suit us anymore today? No, 
are we as facilitators now getting much more global? We, we have a, a div especially in South Africa, we've got such a diverse group of people in, in our midst. I mean, we were facilitating the day, and I don't know how many backgrounds there were, but I mean, when I listened to all the languages they can speak, and, uh, and I was African, I mean, you know, I, I don't need to tell you. I, I'm learning from you, so <laughs> you know. But I mean, with all this diversity, even in our midst, we, uh, we don't even have to go cross border for this. <coughs> Not even uh, for the Shamaris. But we, uh, we, we need to start unlearning some stuff and learning simple things. And, and, and maybe it's a, it's a bit of a, <coughs> a topic that, that a lot of people don't speak about, but especially in Western <coughs> media, they want us to hate Muslims. Now, if you've only ever had that, before I came here, the only thing I knew about South Africa, and to be quite honest, it was simply that the blacks hated the whites and the whites hated the blacks, <coughs> and that was it. Now, sh shocked, to say the least, when I first came here, and I'm, I'm lucky because Arthur, with 20 years' experience, has, has, has given me so much depth of knowledge about people that it, it's, I mean, I would never have learned that in, in 10 years, I suppose. But the media tries to get you these kind of things. So if, if media does that kind of st stuff, what else gives you wrong information because of they want, to, they want you to have that? So, but how do you know it's wrong information? I didn't know until I came to South Africa that it was wrong. So we, you know, sometimes it's, the internal, it, it becomes pretty hard, but first of all, we need to realize what do we need to change? And sometimes in our speaking, have we got habits, have we uh, taken on board some habits that actually don't suit us, that are wrong for what we're doing? Are we not getting through to the audiences the way we should, the way we would like to, and the way we, we have to, to become the best person for our audience? Mm -hmm. Because we have habits that at the moment we don't know about yet, or, or at the moment we just find hard to change. So, this is the exercise, it's, it's, it's a very interesting exercise, and when I did it the first time, uh, it, it was a challenge, but what color is it? Now, what we're going to do in this exercise is, I'll show you the first slide, there you go. What you're going to do again in the same pair as you are, and, and of course, uh, I don't know if you can time each other, if you can't, it's fine. If you can time each other, that's fine. Uh, we, we see who can do it fastest. Now, in your pairs, you're going to go up and down. So you're going to red, yellow, all the way down to red, and you start yellow. So you're going to go up and down <coughs> the lines as fast as you can. Right? And once you've done this, then we'll wait for the other half. This yeah. So if you can time yourself even better. With your partner. Green. 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 Well, it's the same. Red is red, yellow is yellow. So I mean it's yes, read read it. Okay? Red, Go for it. Green, red, black from the bottom. Red, red, yellow, red, orange, red, yellow, black, red, green, which is not green. Orange is purple, red, black, red, orange, which is orange, yellow, yeah. from the bottom, purple, yeah. and uh, blue, black, red, purple, uh, yellow, red, black, red. Red, yellow, black, blue, green, purple, red, purple, black, purple, red, green, red, blue, yellow, green, red, yellow, blue, orange, yellow, red, red, blue, red, yellow, black, purple, red, green, purple, orange, purple, red. Okay, once you're done, orange. The other one gets a shot. Okay, so you're all done? Both sides? Okay. Now we're going to make it a little bit more interesting. And this one, the, the timing is, uh, is the important one, really. What we're going to do now is the next slide you're going to see, you're going to, re you're going to tell us what color it is. So you're going to tell us the color, not the word. 
<laughs> yeah? <laughs> Anybody understand that? So yeah. it's going to be the color. Now, what you're going to do is, you're going to do the same, uh, same again, up and down. When you give us the wrong color, you start again at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to see how quickly you can do that. Are you ready? The first one. Okay, and, and once the first one's done, just go on the second one. That makes it easier. There you go. The color you see, not the word. Shout the color you see, and somebody said, Green, 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 green. <laughs> I did it afterwards because otherwise it would be a smart idea. did it before that. Um, can you all stand up, please? Now, if any of you, and, oh, not the first one, because any of you did the second one in less than 90 seconds, if, if you took more than 90 seconds, please sit down. So if anybody did it in less than 70 seconds, please uh, please be standing. Less than 70 seconds. No, uh, we'll, we'll let you stand now because you've got to sit down anyway. If anybody less than 50 seconds. I don't think so. Please be standing. Less than 50, still be standing. Less than 40. Okay, I, I mean, all three of you. Matt, what was it? 35. 35. 32. Oh, okay. 31, 32, and 35. I'll give all three of them an applause. Thank <laughs> you. 
Sometimes you don't even read that fast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, look, as you found out, the first one was easy, but but some of the things we learn can actually get in the way, yeah. can't they? Mm -hmm. Some of them quite significantly, yeah. you know. And uh, it was quite interesting. But when these things happen, and all of a sudden your mind gets scrambled mm -hmm. because it's not natural anymore. We, ha we haven't learned that. Yeah. I mean, we, we want to read what we see, not the colors That's behind it. But if you, if you said just read, you would have just read through that in the same speed as the last one. <laughs> you wouldn't have worried about the colors. But now it was a different color. And if you, if you g gave them car names, you would have read through them. You would have said had colors as well. But it's the confusion it caused in your brain. You, you got confused. So, you know, it's, it's sometimes quite a hindrance when these, uh, when these things we do learn, we mix them up, and all of a sudden, we get stuck. Now. Here's another question for you. <coughs> Who's ever watched a, a movie on TV with subtitles? Did mm. you enjoy that? No. Was it actually a good movie? If it's Chinese, then yeah. Sorry? <laughs> if it's Chinese, then yeah. No, we don't want to know that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean... Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> did you need subtitles? Did you need subtitles? Did you subtitles? Chinese. <laughs> so, okay, but you know, when you're actually reading a film, so you don't really see an awful lot of the fine acting. You don't. You miss some of the music. You miss some of the whole picture. Yet sometimes it's still an, an enjoyable film. Now, who likes going to the pictures and see a film there? Who prefers that? Not necessarily with subtitles, but just a film. Who loves watching a film in the, in the cinema, the picture house, yeah. movie house? Okay, now. Do you know why you like that better than sitting in front of the television, apart from the fact that the comfort and all that? Do you know why yeah, that actually happens? Very good answer. Yes. What I would like you to do, and you can sit down for this. I, another little exercise, but you can sit down now. You know, if, if you're done, you're standing up. Put your hands about the, Now watch that you don't swipe any drinks off the table or smack something else in your mouth. You know. Now, what I want you to do is start wiggling your thumbs and face forward and when you become aware of both of your thumbs stop when you become aware of so if you have to go here it doesn't matter but when you become aware of your thumbs stop when you can see them yeah when you, when you become aware of both thumbs not just one no, both so you, you move them both forward and when you become aware of the, 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 the wriggling of your thumbs stop okay now okay you can put them down now now I see that um, that happens actually <laughs> Most of them are between maybe 160, 170 degrees, so it's, it's somewhere about here you become aware of it. Now, that's another phenomenon that happens as well. That's why a cinema film is actually much more enjoyable because that whole area is filled up with movie. Now, if you sit at home watching t TV, you get distracted by maybe some of the kids um, sitting on the laptops or they, they're playing in a corner. But although you're sitting watching that, and you know that, that's roughly where it is. You, you sit watching that television, but you, you're aware of all that. Now I'm going to ask you, not just as a speaker, but your audience. What are they aware of when you stand on that stage? And it's not only <coughs> where you are, where you're at. It's everything else they become aware of. No, you become aware. You should be aware of your audience. That you, you don't have to look there all the time. You should you should know your audience are there. But now. What are the people you are actually wanting to, to, to impact? What are they seeing? Are they, are they getting distracted by stuff that's happening around you? Or even on you? Is there stuff on your stage that shouldn't be there? That is distracted, you know, there's so much that can't go wrong, but they have everything. So, and sometimes, you know, people get a feeling. Now, when you stand on that stage without having said a word, they already get a feeling, they get a, a perception of, of, of who you are. And sometimes when you open your mouth, it's a pleasant surprise that it's not what they thought. <laughs> sometimes, sadly enough, it is. <laughs> but now we'll go take it a little bit further. You know, it's our behavior and their perceptions. I want to actually ask you a question here. Moving on a stage, it becomes now more important, of course. If you, you know, we're all said, you know, you, 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 move, you move when you talk about the past and the future. So, which way do you move when you talk about the past? So, on a stage, which way would you move? 
Left or right? Left. Left. Yeah. So you move to the left. Past is over left. Yeah. Move to your your right. My right. Why would I move to my right? Because we move that way. So. Yes. Now you know, and and I'm just. <laughs> that was simple for you, but there are so many people, who actually move to their left on stage, and it's 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 a natural thing for 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 people because what happens is your memory is on the left, your construction and your future is in the right, but we have to remember, we have to give it a mirror image, so one of the things you should always remember that if you actually want to to use that and. They don't, most of them don't know why you do it. But if you're going to talk about your, your past, and then you come back to where you are at now, and in the future, it might be a natural, because for your natural stuff, now you know this kind of stuff, you should be moving the, the other direction. But the people might not know this. But this is only a simple thing, but something is not right for them. You know? And if you, I mean, even this little thing, moving in the right direction, I've heard it so many times. But they say, oh no, you need to move to your left. I say, okay. That is, if you're sitting in, a, in, in the audience, it's fine. But if you're standing for them, who do you do it for? For yourself? Or do you do it for your audience? So that's one thing you have to remember. And who knows who, uh, who this guy is? Albert Merabian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Do you actually, yeah, apart from this title. <laughs> you know, you know. See? That's why he's the president of this club. By the way. <laughs> and yes, you can sit down, you don't have to stand up. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is the guy who developed the, the, all the percentages for your words, tonality, body language. Does anybody know what they are? Yeah. Seven. It's how we Seven. express emotions when you can 726. Yeah. 726 and whatever the difference is. Whatever it's 55, 38, and 7, and it's how we. Um, mm -hmm display emotion when you communicate. Yes, exactly this. There, there they are. The words are 7%, the voice 38, the body is 55. Now, what do we spend most of our time on though? <laughs> yes. See, I had a challenge with this for a while and I spent so much time on the words and then sometimes because I spent so much time on the words I forgot about all the other things and, and, and I forgot half my speech because I was so nervous because I spent time on the words. Now. Would it make any sense that you, you started paying a bit more attention to body language and voice? Because have you ever st stood in front of an audience or even had a, a conversation with somebody and that person, there was something that wasn't right. Sometimes it's, it, it, it felt even shifty. And it's not because of what they said, but it's about the other things that were going on. So, I mean, ideally, we, we, we work on all three, you know? It's, uh, if you can work on all three and uh, all three and you get it right, then, you know, here's it. Know thyself, know thy audience, and know thy stuff. No, so you actually have to work on all three. But, I mean, really know where the impact is the greatest. So if you can improve 10% on your words or 10% on your body language, the body language is going to have a, a much more impact. And the people don't necessarily even know that because body language is 55%. It's huge. Now, the messenger, I will quickly go through this, you know, the, the, the character of the speaker, because the, uh, the messenger is important, but of course, who is the most important? The messenger, the words, or the audience? The audience. Of course, the audience. But when you've got a messenger, you've got to look at the character, the body language, vocal delivery, charisma, personality, accessibility, vulnerability. All of these things can either help or hinder you. But if you, if you look into these things, they'll certainly give you uh, a, a lot of help in being the messenger. Then we go to the audience. Again, meet them wh where they are, connect on common ground, solve their problems, interesting to them. It's not at no point whether you are interesting, but are you interesting to them? No. So they need to be interested in what, uh, what they see because as we, the audience is always the most exp uh, important. So it's not what we want to say, it's always what they need to hear. Credible to them, to them relevant, and the credibility also that has again to do with, the, with what we say, what we do, and what we, uh, that, that, the way we say it, and your target market. And then of course you've got a message, 
words used, can you make it more interesting? How many stories are you using? Examples, human excitement, efficiency, and again, relevant. Now all these kind of things, it, it's, it, I know it's a lot of common sense, but sometimes we need to go back and how, much, how many of these things in each of these sections can we improve on to become better? And where should we, for ourselves, maybe some of us are absolutely tremendous on body language, but tonality might be a bit level, so we need to work a little bit on that. But whatever you need to work on, there is all these areas within each one of them that you can improve on. It's not just one little thing. Les Brownwell says, natural speaker. He says, show me a natural heart surgeon. So there's no such thing as a natural speaker. And all that list you just saw, every one of them, you can practice and you can work on. Now, how natural do I look? Again, there's an exercise we are not going to do just now, but you can actually do this at home. Do a sign with using your, and, and we're all right-handed here, so the left, but the non-dormant hand, sign your signature. Even when you say, I love writing, I love signing my name. Say that, say that when you do it with your non-dormant hand. And then afterwards, do it with your, your, uh, your, your practicing hand. It sh just shows you that we get, we are much better, we get frustrated when we do it with the wrong one. It looks probably horrible for most of us, including me. And that's because we haven't practiced any of this. We are we're used to practice on one side. Some people are ambidextrous, and congratulations. <laughs> we don't include you in this. But, you know, it, it does happen. Some people are, are equally good. Also, I just want to speak to the heart. I don't want to tell you too much about it, but most people need a, an awful lot of depth of knowledge about what they're going to say, because if you just speak for the heart and hope that the words come through you, and then you're five minutes into your speech and, and you see people taking no notes when you expect them to, where are you going to go? If you haven't got a depth. So it, it, it'll work for some, and it's very good because if you can speak from the heart, and Arthur is absolutely excellent at that because she's got such a wealth of knowledge, she can speak anytime. And she touches your heart because you become vulnerable, you become you, and it's real. It's, 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 it's great for, a, for, a, for an audience to see that. Uh, Mutashi, 400 years uh, before Christ, he said, You can only fight the way you train. And, and we can put it, you can only practice. You can only present the way you practice. That is in speaking and presentations. So if you don't practice, how can you present? If you don't uh, train yourself, and I say uh, most of you do, if you don't actually work on your speaking skills, what are you going to present? Confidence is preparation. Everything else is beyond your control. Now, what I'm going to do is, there's six points here to more effective speaking. I'm going to go through them very quickly, and you can get them as well. But uh, Aristotle said 350 BC, Ethos, Logos, Pathos, the speaker character, the proof of the message, and emotional receptivity of the audience. And of course, the audience is more, uh, most important. How to be interested? Use your stories as a vehicle to, make the, to take the point to your audience. And then the, the length of your story is very important. I'll show you very quickly after. What's the point, and how does the story make that point? So make your story an example so you do, of that point, so you don't act afterwards have to go and explain the point again. You know? So, what is the point and how does that story make the point? Connect with the audience. And as I said already, it's, it's not to impress, but connect on common ground. If you can connect on common ground, they will be impressed with wh what they're hearing, not because of what you say. See, if you want to impress them, and that makes you here and them there, and uh, you'll never connect. So, you know, talk about your failure, uh, failures. Brene Brown has a brilliant video, talks about vulnerability. It's, you, need to, you need to watch it, it's awesome. But it talks about this kind of stuff. An effective use of a quote or saying, and, and don't necessarily do that at the beginning of your story, because then you give the surprise away. So if you want to do that somewhere cemented in, maybe even towards the end to give that a punch and give a, a, a great quote, even when you might have made up yourself. But as long as it cements that story, it will really emphasize something that people will remember, because people remember an awful lot of quotes. Allow your material to, to evolve and develop what works well and delete what doesn't. So you don't always have to, to, to get a new um, story, a new keynote for every different audience, but you can adapt it, and you, you know, when, through time you see what works well. <coughs> I'm going to show you this right now. What this is, is a John Maxwell speech. Now he is one of the best storytellers in the world. What this is, is an 88 minute keynote, and what you see there is uh, the, the, the opening, then the PS's, the personal stories, the ST's are, are cards, uh, the uh, statistics, LC laminated cards, T is, is information. That is actually, you see very few T's and hypothetical examples. 
So what happened in this, this 35 components in that 88 minute speech, yet only 11 and a half minutes of that speech was actually physical teaching. Now I've heard this speech four or five times now, and every time it's enjoyable. And it's because he, he, he brings that story so well and he's got points in it. Now if I put that in, if you look at the stories he's got, he's got 15 stories in there, and uh, every story is very short, as you see. There's only two. The, that one and uh, those two are over five minutes, but the average story he's got to bring a point is 2.59 minutes. The less than three minutes, the average story, and he's got 15 of them in there. So short stories, punchy, bring the points in, and John does it so well. But he, he, mean, he said, I've, I've done 12,000, more than 12,000 keynotes now. If I'm not good now, I should be doing something else. You know? <laughs> and he's good at it. So if you look at this, the, the, the keynote, again, 11 and a half minutes of teaching, and the rest, very few statistics, but the rest is all stories, and, and it's an amazing. Hopefully you get a chance to watch it sometime, it's absolutely an amazing story. So here we've got that speech again. Now, what if you want to, you've got a lot of knowledge in it, you want to take it to your public. And say, okay, I need to bring this. So never mind the stories, I need to, I've got so much that people need to hear. And they take out all the rest. So your, your speech is gonna look like this. Now, we'll, okay, we'll put them all in a row. I just said it's 11 and a half minutes and you've got a 45 minute keynote. Now you need to look for another 30 odd minutes, 33 and a half for those uh, who, are, uh, who want to correct me. But says, okay, now I'm gonna Google uh, and, and I've, got all, I've got books, I'm gonna get more of it. Now we're gonna get here. Now we've got a story, 18 minutes, or 45 minutes, we're there. Now we're gonna bring it to the public. Now, I don't even need to ask you what's gonna happen. You know, um, what's gonna happen is, yeah, and it's not that it's, it's boring, no, you're actually gonna flatline the audience. You know, because people are done. Uh, there is very few people who can sit through, through and I've sat through, unfortunately, sat through, through, through some trainings and meetings where, where this is happening, but you flatline them, you lose your people, there's nothing, uh, you, you're never gonna get asked back, because if you want to actually make some money in this as well, you better make, uh, you better uh, get the two, uh, the two pods out and go, <coughs> bring it back to life. You know, so that other stuff doesn't work. Too much information kills, and, and then, people through PowerPoints and get all that information on PowerPoints as well, then they're really finished. But then you take that. Now, what you use for these spikes, payoffs, aha moments, funny things, surprises, shocks, and also, also some sad stuff. And I'll give you a very short story that has some of this stuff in it. And it was when I was three years old. I was always very curious and uh, as a three-year-old, I used to, my, we, we lived above a shop, a music shop, as I said earlier, and I, <coughs> went, I quite often wandered into the shop, sometimes without any clothes on, to my mother, mother's despair. <laughs> but this, this particular day, I, I, I wandered into the back of the shop, and my dad had a little workshop there. Now, because of the music shop, he had record players and all that kind of stuff, and he had them plugged in, so they had all kind of PowerPoints along the wall. And I'm walking past these things, and then holding the PowerPoints were two pins. So I walk into this, this, this workshop, and I see, uh, I rummage about and I see a, cu a couple of nails. So I, 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 I pick up two nails. I know exactly what I'm gonna do with them. <laughs> so I wander back into the shop, three year old, and I bounce back and sit in front of one of these sockets. <laughs> and yeah, I take one of the nails. I think that's, that fits in there, and I push it in there and it fits in very snugly. Yes, I did take up the other nail. So I pick up the other nail and I put it in the other hole. And then, nothing. Now, with my curiosity, I hadn't got a clue what I was expecting to happen, but, but nothing happened. So I thought, well, if nothing is gonna happen anyway, I might as well take them out. And I took them both out at the same time. <laughs> and then I, I flew about two meters back. Now, I know I, I was the first load shedding, like there was me getting thrown <laughs> over there somewhere. I flew, I, I was dazed, the, the, the shot was blackened, and I thought, what just happened? No. It was, I was curious. And after that, I got, I never, you know, that kind of curiosity gave me some, the, the same kind of respect for electricity as most people now for their bank manager. You know, <laughs> and my parents, they, uh, they were actually sad after that because I never stopped my curiosity. And a lot more of these kind of things happened. 
And I can tell you something, I never ever did that again. <laughs> <laughs> so even in a short story of about a minute and a half, you get a few of these kind of things going on. It's a funny story, it's, it's personal, I know it's, I, I, I lived it but, and, and how can I ever forget? I've done a few other things with, with electricity, but it's a little bit of funny, there's a surprise, there is a aha for me, aha, you know, afterwards when I woke up, and the shock of course, and my parents were the only ones out. So you can cover some of these things in tiny little bits, but if you get little stories, and, and the, it, it's part of a bigger story, but uh, it was actually about curiosity, that whatever happens to you, you should never lose your curiosity. Because when you're curious and you start being creative, that's how we actually develop our world. We need, to be, we need more of our children, more of our parents, more of our colleagues to become more creative. This is part of the message. But yeah, so I hope you've got a, an idea about some of the stuff. This is only a, a very short part of it. Um, I do uh, speaker workshops and we've got a, a speaker club starting very shortly as well on a weekly basis. And again, as I said, uh, you know, we, we need to, to start getting practice in, in front of our people. We are, uh, we use uh, the, the John Maxwell method as 26 principles. So we've got for 26 weeks, we've got something different every week. But it's something, it's, you know, I hope you got something out of this, you know, because practice, repetition, experience, however you're going to do it. I hope you found out that it's necessary, that some of it's natural. Some of the stuff we do as speakers, we need to put the habit because we can't do all of it when we stand there speaking. Some of the stuff that happens that you need to know, their body language, we need to actually learn it so well that the, these, these good things become habits so we don't need to think about it and that's when you become a natural speaker. I wish you well. Thank you very much. Firstly, thank you so much for giving of your time and giving us aha moments, <laughs> giving us the experience and I hope that you've got somebody to share a second bottle of wine with and somebody else that you can actually give some chocolates to. I will do my best and thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be here and, and a, a privilege to be part of the PSA. Thank, thank you, you so much for giving us a good time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to invite our ambassador to the Global Speakers Federation just to come and give us some information uh, very quickly about the GSF. Stay you may indeed. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, does everyone here know about the GSF, the Global Speakers Federation? No. Okay, that's part of the reason why I'm the ambassador for the GSF. Um, so the GSF is a organization of 18 different speaker associations globally <coughs> um, in various different countries. Um, and membership to the GSF comes with professional membership to the PSA. Uh, part of the membership and something we're trying to drive from the GSF is if anyone is traveling overseas, going to another country where there is a PSA um, chapter there, let me know, I can get in touch with the, those chapters there and put you in touch with the presidents and so on there. Vice versa, when someone comes here, they get in touch with me, we bring them over here. Trish was an example with Gavin. Um, Trish from Australia came through, I took her out for the day, showed her Victoria, between Gavin and I showed her around. Um, and then, yeah, so if anyone's traveling, let me know. I was in Canada recently. I got to meet up with the presidents of CAPS in Canada. We had a fantastic lunch, found out how they did things, uh, quite a bit differently to here, but great getting that sort of insight. Then with GSF, there is also the Global Speakers Summit coming up in February. That's over 70 speakers that will be speaking in New Zealand. Uh, the theme is from leader to legacy and uh, unfortunately submissions for speaking are closed but if anyone wants to find out more you can go to gss2018.com that's about it thank you ross um, i think what we're not going to do is we're not going to do this thing of, of inspire because of we we've unfortunately just run out of a little bit of time over here uh, to everybody who has contributed this evening I really cannot thank you enough. I really appreciate all the guests that have attended, the, the people that have participated, the people that have led sessions. Um, in terms of moving forward, there is something that I do want to raise with the, with the group. Again, I want to raise the issue about seat at my table. 
Seat at my table is an opportunity for speakers that are in the industry to actually get together in an informal setting, in a setting of people's home, and actually just have discussions, uh, discussions uh, um, about them personally and about their personal experiences. And it really is, it's a privilege. It's, it's an absolute privilege to sit with people and chat with people that have similar interests and have similar desires to you. But there's something that is falling apart with us, and I'll tell you what it is. People are booking, because we can only take 10 or 12 people into people's homes, and then they're not pitching. Now we've decided that we're gonna do something about this. I'm talking to this audience about it very, very specifically, because there's no one involved over here that has actually done this. But I'm promising you that moving forward, anybody that books on a seat at my table and doesn't pitch will not be invited back. And that is something we, we, we have to do, because people cater, they spend, they spend fortune of money in terms of catering, but we're having people that are saying they're gonna be there and then they don't pitch. We want to run this. We don't only want to run it from people that are part of a committee. What I'm asking here tonight as well is, is there anybody over here that would like to run a seat at my table dinner later this month? Yeah. <laughs> don't worry, you won't be blacklisted if you don't. <laughs> I'll, I'll send it out on a, on a newspaper. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot. That's what we'll do. Everybody, thank you. I hope you gained from this evening. Um, I, a lot. I think we all did. Thank you so much to the speakers, to the contributors. And once again, have a lovely time. We'll see you next month. The information is on the agenda as to who our speaker is. And uh, we'll see you next month.